Good evening. Welcome to worship. Welcome to Trinity. We are grateful that you're here on this beautiful evening and in this beautiful space. We are entering into the month of October. Obviously, we're not quite there yet, just a day off. Um, but all through the month of October, so including tonight, we are adjusting our worship a little bit. So our, I mean, no surprises. But some of our language will be different. If you've been coming to worship for the last month, some of the, some of the words in the confession of forgiveness will be different. Prayers will be different. The language will be a little bit different. And some of our music will be just a little bit different. Obviously, it's all up here on the wall, just like, as we always expected. All the music is in the red book in front of you, marked worship in the binder. Just wanted to give you that heads up. We are grateful to Lisa for leading us through worship this night. Again, thank you for coming. Let us begin. Friends, will you rise your able? Gathered by the Holy Spirit into the merciful presence of God, we confess our sin before each other, that we might receive forgiveness through Christ and know again how we are restored to life. Amen. God of grace, we confess that we are bound to sin and will not free ourselves. We confess how we have cast judgment upon our neighbors. We confess to hold your grace from others. We confess our unwillingness to love as we are loved. Speak when your words are needed and respond to justice with action. Merciful God, we seek your forgiveness as we fall short of your glory. We ask you to turn us toward life in you. People of God, remember the promise we have been given in baptism. Though we fall short of the glory of God, God is rich in mercy. By grace you have been saved. In creation we are, in Christ we are a new creation, restored to life and to each other. You are forgiven of all your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
God is good all the time. Let us pray. God of our redemption, only through Christ do we know the grace you give. Silence the assumptions we have that we must earn your love or capture your attention. Encircle us in peace, that we might be turned toward loving our neighbors. In your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading for this evening comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians, the second chapter Paul writes, Adopt the attitude that was in Christ Jesus. Though he was in the form of God, he did not consider himself being equal with God something to exploit, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave and by becoming like human beings. When he found himself in the form of a human, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God highly honored him and gave him a name above all names, so that all the name of Jesus, that at the name of Jesus, everyone in heaven, on earth, and under the earth might bow, and every tongue might confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here ends our first reading. And our second reading, also from Paul, is from Paul's letter to the Romans. We are in the fifth chapter. Paul writes, Therefore, since we have been righteous, Through his faithfulness, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have access by faith into this grace in which we stand through him. And we boast in the hope of God's glory. But not only that. We even take pride in our problems because we know that trouble produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. This hope doesn't put us to shame. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. While we were still weak. At the right moment, Christ died for ungodly people. It isn't often that someone will die for a righteous person, though maybe someone might dare dare to die for a good person. But God shows his love for us, because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So now that we have been made righteous by his blood, we can even more certain that we will be saved from God's wrath through him. If we were reconciled to God through the death of his son while we were still enemies... Now that we have been reconciled, how much more certain is it that we will be saved by his life? And not only that, we even take pride in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, the one through whom we now have a restored relationship with God. The word of the Lord be to God. So I grew up on, out in the country and I grew up on a road that has a T. In fact, I was in the corner of that T. We had the paved road, which was the fun country road that people would drive up and down because it had, you know, bends and turns and hills. I grew up outside of Galena, so there's some fun driving to be had out there, and my road was one of them. And it was pretty narrow, so if a tractor was coming, you had to pull off almost to the ditch to let them by. It was one of those kind of roads. Still is. And at the T where my parents' house was, where I grew up, there was also a gravel road that went to the south. Now, we have to put our memory hats on for this next part to work. There was a time in our life when we didn't have Google Maps. There was a time in our life when we maybe would ask for directions when we got disoriented because we weren't entirely sure where we were going. So people would drive up and down our road or bike up and down our road because it's kind of a fun, run, a fun drive to take. It would run you up into Wisconsin and back down into Illinois. My neighbors across the road were from Wisconsin. It was kind of one of those fun things. People would wander through our roads and at some point apparently would need to get back to what's called Highway 20. Highway 20 is this north-south road, or at least in my part of the world, it's north-south. And if you envision it being here, the road that I grew up on was right here. So presumably, people who might have some sense of direction or some sense of where they've been would tell themselves, we need to go south and we'll get back to Highway 20 and get on the road and go back to where we came from. So they would come to the T in the road and they would come to the gravel road in the corner where I lived and they'd go down that gravel road and they'd drive it for about two miles and then suddenly they would come to a gate because on the other side of that gate inevitably was probably Holstein's because the road goes nowhere. It was just at one point a lane, and then it was a farm lane, and now it's just this gravel road that goes to a pasture. But inevitably, people would drive down that road, and it was like this thing. You would see people drive down the road, five minutes later, they'd drive up the road, and this didn't happen a lot. But once in a great while, somebody, maybe my dad was in the garage, or maybe I was out mowing, 
and they'd pull up along the side of the house, and they'd flag us over, and they would ask how to get back to Highway 20. And in good country bumpkin sense, we would then tell them, you can't get there from here. I mean, you can. And we'd give them the directions and all the landmarks. Look for the four sallow farm over here and look for the one with all the cows out front over there and then make the turn over here. You can get back to Highway 20, but conceivably you can't get there from here. So I want to invite us to take that phrase, which maybe we've heard before, maybe we've said before. You can't get there from here, and I want you to apply that strangely, but follow me with our relationship with God. At the end of this month, we are going to have Reformation weekend, so we are going to celebrate Reformation, kind of a big deal for Lutheran types, which I guess is us. So I thought maybe all this month we could have a little bit of reflection on what are some of the core ideas that make us who we are, because in this community, we have a Methodist church, we have an evangelical free church, we have a brethren church just outside of town, we have a Baptist church. If you wander down the hill, you also have Catholic, Episcopal, Presbyterian, and on and on. So in some sense, we're all the same, right? We're all Christian, we all believe in Jesus and all those sorts of things, but there must be some reason why we put Lutheran on our door and others put Baptist and Methodist and brethren. So I thought for the month of October, and maybe, I don't know, you'll wind up at some trivia contest at a bar one night and Lutheran questions will come up, then you're gonna be set. But I thought for this month, maybe we could reflect on what are some of the reasons why we call ourselves Lutheran? What makes us unique? How do we look at God just a little bit differently? And one of the ways that we look at God just a little bit differently is through this phrase that maybe you've never uttered before and yet is central to our identity, theology of the cross. Maybe you would hear that once in a Sunday school lesson or a confirmation class if you had that kind of a pastor. Maybe you'd hear it in an adult forum or in a book. Theology of the cross basically means this. There's nothing we can do to get ourselves close to God. There's nothing we can do to earn God's love, God's grace, God's forgiveness. You've heard that before. We have an understanding that the cross, Jesus coming to us, we see Jesus through the cross, we see life through the cross. We know we can't get to God because we're human, but we know God comes to us. So God comes to us in the form of us, looks like us, breathes like us, wears hair, maybe like us, maybe combs it differently, and appears just like us, and then takes on our burden, our brokenness, our suffering, and our sin, and destroys it on the cross, and does this because God loves us. You've all heard this before. We can nod our heads. We're about to sing songs where it all sounds familiar. This is all just part of the plan, right? It's part of the ethos of hanging out in a building like this, except that most of our life, we don't hang out in this building, most of our life we hang out in the world, in our lives, at work, at home, at the hospital, wherever we are. And wherever we are outside of these walls, and I don't mean to make it sound like these are protective magic walls, but when we live our lives, most of our life, whether at work or play or at school, or even with the doctor's office, even when we're wrestling with insurance, even when we're buying a car, in many forms and fashions we are told, you got to earn it. You got to step up. You got to work a little bit harder. You got to prove your place. You got to prove your point. You got to earn your health. You got to earn your house. You got to earn your clothes. You got to earn your spot. You must earn. You must do. You must strive. You must grind. That is the world we live in. Now, that's not just a Midwestern work ethic thing. That's not even just an American thing. It's a human thing. We see it all over Scripture. It is in part why Paul wrote this letter to the Romans to confront that idea amongst many ideas that we will hear and see throughout the letter to Romans, but that's one of them he confronts and we hear it in our reading for tonight. This idea that we got to earn, we got to grind, we got to do it, we got to make ourselves a little bit better, a little bit healthier, a little bit stronger, we got a little bit more, a little bit less of who we are and a little bit more of what we should be and that should is always just beyond reach. Now, if that's our lived experience, that's how we walk in the world as humans, logic says that's how God works too. 
Because we're a product of God, and the world is a product of God. So, of course, that must be how it works. So, if we pray a little harder, if we do a little bit more, if we show up to worship, maybe give a little extra, then God's blessings will be fall upon us. And maybe we've heard that once or twice before. If only we X. God is just waiting to bless you. God is just waiting to give you love, grace, all the things that you need so that you can live your best life. But first... You must do. In Lutheran dogma, we call that a theology of glory. It's called a theology of glory as opposed to a theology of the cross because glory is something that we humans want. We have great adoration for God because God has glory, of course. But conceivably, we could get some of that too. Conceivably, we could persevere, we could encounter, we could engage. Maybe we could even impress upon God how worthy we are of just a little bit more grace than what we've already been given, or just some to begin with, and God will love us. Some of the inevitable outcomes, of course, of thinking this way is, one, we will then inevitably see everybody else in the pews around us as our competition for God's grace that if we pray a little bit more than, you know, them, clearly we're a little bit better than them. Or maybe we'd use it in this language, a little less competition, but maybe something about, you know, we've been a little bit more blessed than others, which sounds like God has been hanging out in our house or in our checkbook or at our spot in the hospital room more than the person down the hall. It's called being human. This is what happens when when everything about our lives is told that we must earn and strive and persevere, and when we don't, when we fall short, then we feel like we are the ones who have failed. A theology of the cross tells us there's nothing you can do to impress God. There's nothing you can do to earn God's love, God's grace, God's presence, God's redemption. It is simply given to you. Now, I know, and I hear this even when I'm saying it out loud to myself, there's nothing I can do to impress upon God. Well, maybe there's some wiring within myself or maybe wiring within yourself that can even make us feel a little frustrated, a little disappointed, because everywhere else, if we just do a little bit more, do a little bit less, or improve ourselves in some way, it maybe will work. But it won't work with God. And that sounds disappointing except that it's also liberating to know that this grace, this love that God gives to us, God simply gives to us. And it is full, and it is in abundance, and it is for you, and it's for the person next to you in the pew, and it's for the people who will worship here next week, and it's for people who will never worship in this space, because it is grace. It is a gift. We are being freed and liberated through the cross, to see ourselves fully as people of God as we are and as God continues to move through, in, with, and under us through this water. Every day when we get up, we have the opportunity to remember, not obligation, it's not a requirement, but we have the opportunity to remember when we wash our face or wash our hands that we have been washed in these waters, and these waters bind us to Christ. So that wherever we go, whatever we do, God goes with us. It is a gift. It is not dependent on you. It's always dependent on God. And God will always fulfill God's promise, so God will always be with you. And if God is with you, then God is with your neighbor. And God is at work in this world striving and persevering and countering all the destructive words that we carry within ourselves, that we hear in our community, that maybe we espouse when we are out in the world, that tell us that we must strive and grind and do and overcome and climb over others to get somewhere where we aren't yet. But in the presence of God, And God is in this place, and God is in this meal, and we experience God through this water, and God is with us where we dwell. In the presence of God, we are washed in grace. We are wrapped in love. All the disappointment, all the frustration, all the the division, all the destruction, all that we carry, 
This is what Jesus claims, and Jesus confronts us where we are. When we feel at our lowest, when we feel most hopeless, when we feel like we are encircled and enshrouded in despair, that's when Christ comes to us and reminds us that we are free, that you are loved. When we convince ourselves that we're not worthy of God's love, that we haven't done quite enough yet, we haven't prayed quite the way we meant to pray, sorry, Jesus, I hope you don't mind, but Jesus is already there because you are loved. It is so obvious and so simple and so repetitive to be told that God loves us and that God loves you freely. But we also know how hard that is to believe and how hard that is to hear and how hard that is to center that in our minds. So Jesus keeps coming and keeps washing our hands and washing our face and washing our bodies and reminding us again every day that you are loved by God. That despite how we encounter the world, despite how we walk in the world, despite the ways that we create division and destruction in the world, we are loved by a God who will continue to pursue us and not just us but our neighbors and say it again, you are loved. You are worthy of love. You have been made a new creation in God's love. You reflect God's image through God's love. Because love is what God does. Transformation and new life and redemption, this is what God does. This is why Paul tells us that in the midst of our weakness, when we are still enemies, when we are still sinful in our nature, God already has come to love us, to redeem us, and to set us free. So be free for a moment. When we dip our hands in this water, when we share in this meal, when we sing the words that we know and we've sung a thousand times before, for a moment, hear the Holy Spirit speak to you and then take those words out into the world, speak them to your neighbors, speak them to your coworkers, speak them at trivia night, Tell the people who you encounter, God loves you. And that is enough. Because you are enough. Amen. Amen. Please rise, you're able. Let us confess our faith by the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. <clears throat> the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Remembering the caring and generous works of God, we pray for the church, creation, and the needs of our neighbors. We put our trust in you as we pray for our church. Give Bishop Eaton and Bishop Fiddler, pastors, deacons, lay leaders, and teachers the gifts of wisdom and discernment. Be with them in bold truth and faithful witness. God, in your mercy, lead us in your wisdom as we pray for creation. Empower us to look to the interests of others who, who make choices that impact the environment. Summon us to be advocates for healthy waterways, habitats, and air. We continue to pray for our people across the planet who are striving for recovery after natural disasters. God, in your mercy. Lead us in justice as we pray for those in government, the military, and positions of authority. We pray for our elected officials and our school administrators. We pray for our chief of police, sheriff, and state police officers. Give them humble and willing hearts, looking always to the needs of others. God, in your mercy. Trusting your goodness, we pray for all caregivers and people who are sick or suffering in any way, especially those we name now aloud or in our hearts. We also pray for Ruby, Linda, Sophia, Ruth Ann, Angie, Jackie, and Lexi. God, in your mercy. Knowing your words breathe life into despair, we pray for all who strive for equity and justice for themselves and others, for advocates in schools and voices in our community. We seek your protection and assurance. God, in your mercy. Help us, Lord, to remember the gift of grace you wash upon us and our neighbors. Silence our worry that we are not yet enough. Draw us ever toward your cross, that we know and believe that your love is abundant and freely given. God, in your mercy. Receive our prayers and answer us, O God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Please share that peace with your neighbor. So as always, you have the announcements in front of you, um, and uh, the tidings is out. Um, so read through those and see what's going on in the life of our church. So just a couple things pull off the page. This Wednesday night, uh, Trinity Nights returns, so we gather the way it works. If you have not attended one yet, we gather at 5.30 for food, and it's totally free. Just show up, and we will feed you, and then we'll hang out. It's all basically in this space right below here. Um, we gather for food around the kitchen, around the table, and then after that, uh, we often do a devotion, and then we have activities. And each, every month, the food's a little different. Every month, the activities are a little bit different. And within all of that, we are getting to know each other. So if you haven't been to one yet and want to check it out, uh, please, we hope that you're able to do that. Beyond that, like I said, read through everything that's going through here. Um, for those who are keeping track or are curious, we have a reading schedule, a, bi a scripture reading schedule for the month of October. Uh, if you've been doing these at all this year, you'll see that this one is a little bit different. It's not actually one book of the Bible. It is, well, a lot of books of the Bible. It's, these, in essence, what this is, is these are fundamental ways of how Lutherans are Lutheran. And so these are kind of like the texts that we use to shape what we would call our theology, our doctrine, our dogma, whatever fancy word you want to impress people with, you can use all of them. 
But these are basically how we structure that. It's not comprehensive, but it's quite a bit. Also, if you've been hesitant to jump into the Bible because some of our readings have been chapters long on a daily basis, some of these readings are only a verse. This might be an accessible way for you to step into the Bible if you find that intimidating or difficult for any reason. Friends, will you please rise as you're able and we will prepare for communion. Let us pray together. God of mercy and grace, the eyes of all wait upon you, and you open your hand in blessing. Fill us with good things at your table, that we may come to the help of all in need. In your name we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty, and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name as we anticipate grace in this meal. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, and when he gave thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Confident our Lord is at work in this meal, we offer the prayer that he first taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The meal is prepared. Come, taste and see.
Friends, would you please rise if you're able. Sent into the world with Christ, let us pray. Almighty God, grant that your holy word, which has been proclaimed and sung this day, may enter into our hearts through your grace. May it produce in us the fruit of the Spirit for witness and service in the world. In all we say and do, make your presence known. In your name we pray. Amen. Friends, remember again our baptismal promise. You are saved by grace. In Christ, you are a new creation. By God's mercy, you have been restored to life, that you live fully with our neighbors. Be blessed in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit this day and every day, wherever you may go. Amen. Amen. peace serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.